morning, I'm TJ, and today I will show you how to set up and run a FEDEM suspension system or a trailer suspension system. And the example is from a machine element exam or machine builder exam at NTNU. Uh, I won't show you exactly how to do it, but describe how you can model joints, strain gauges, functions, sensors, forces, apply structural damping, axial dampers, and control systems. And I will also demonstrate some post-processing uh, <coughs> features in FEDEM, animations and curve plotting, and I will benchmark the results from FEDEM with analytical calculations. And this is the same model as I used to benchmark the SOL 109 and 1112 um, solvers in NX. Here is the sketch from the machine element exam, and this is the trailer suspension system and the torsional beam. Uh, we have the quite rigid arm uh, and the wheel hub. And uh, you can see the main dimensions here. And I will show you how this one is ex a model in FEDEM. FEDEM is a direct uh, solver, nonlinear finite element solver, and it's designed for mechanism simulations, basically. But you can compare it with the SOL109 and the 601 solvers in NX. And let's have a look at how this one is modeled in FEDEM. This is how the model is uh, represented in FEDEM. Here we have this torsional beam and this rigid bar and the damper. And the wheel hub is not modeled, but is represented by a lumped mass. And the lumped mass is concentrated in this triad. And um, here I have added an additional mass of nine kilos, which is the same as used in uh, exam. Uh, if you look at these two FEM models, they are meshed in NX and imported to FEDEM. I have a separate video on how to do that. And um, here you can see that these models both have the same stiffness proportional damping of 0 0.0095. And that's because I've done a test simulation and I can load the animation. And um, here you see the eigenfrequency frequency is 10 Hertz. And this is a steel material, so what I've done is to use the spreadsheet, which I've sh shown in a pr previous video. And here I've used stiffness proportional damping. I specified the only eigenfrequency of interest is 10 Hertz, because that's the one that gives me the vertical uh, motion of the wheel hub. And then I've specified 3% uh, damping of that frequency, and that gives me a stiffness proportional damping of this value. And I used that one here for both structures and then you can see the mesh it's um, quite dense okay surface perhaps I must switch on this bottom first and I have to switch off the transparency then you see the mesh and um, in order to capture the the strain the sh maximum shear strain without doing a full FEM analysis, I put some strain gauges here. And um, yeah, they are quite straightforward. I can delete the results and I can apply one strain gauge just to demo how do you do it. Here, strain reset. And here I can click on this node, that node, this one, and this one. And then you can specify the reference direction with a line on the FEM model, and then I've specified another strain gauge. Let's press done. Here it is, and this is a single strain gauge, but I can specify I want a triple 45 strain gauge here. And this is the first direction, the second and the third direction of the rosettes. But I don't need this one, I've already made it. But now you see how you do it. Okay, and then I can move back to my line view without the mesh and I can put add some transparency and that string gauge will give me the ma maximum shear stress and also the phonesis if I want because that's uh, two of the questions in the exam uh, let's have a line view of this here you see at one end here I have a rigid joint and um, it's connected to ground earth which is my reference plane. I switched it off. 
and uh, that means it's connected to rigid ground. It should actually be a um, trailer frame, but it's not here. It's not modeled, so I, put, I connect it to ground. And then the other part is connected to the torsion beam. And then on the other side here, I have, let's put on the solid view. I have two rigid joints and they are connected to the arm and the torsional beam. And I have another one on the other side, which represents two wells. And if this was a rigid body model, I would have put on two times six, 12 constraints uh, between on this part, and that would be a, give me an over constrained system, but not when I have a finite element model. Here in the middle of these, I have a revolute joint, and that revolute joint is connected to earth and the torsion beam. And that gives me a motion that I want. And this means that uh, this torsion bar is supported at both ends, here rigidly, and here with a rotational joint. So when this um, bar is loaded, this one will twist due to the rotational joint and the rigid connections between these two parts. So that gives me the functional features I want. Then I have to switch off the gravity, edit, model preferences. Here is no gravity because in the exam uh, gravity was not included. And then I have yeah, this triad which have this additional mass of 9 kilos and then I have a load here which is applied. This is the load from ground, the excitation load, which we will use. And here you see that uh, right now it's uh, represented by one function called limited ramp, which will ramp up the load to 1000 newtons. But I have other functions which I can replace it with, depending on what simulation I want to run. And here you see that directions, the direction of this um, load is in the vertical direction, pointing upwards. This is the from point and this is the to point and it refers to rigid ground. That means this is a conservative load. If I wanted to make a follower load I could have selected here uh, a from point on, on this bar and a to point on the other end of the bar. Then the load will follow the large deformation I might have in this part. That will give me a non-conservative load. Here I have also modeled a sensor, a displacement sensor. Uh, I will explain later how it use, I use it because I will connect this uh, structural system to our control system later. So this is pretty much the model I have. And then I have a actual damper. And uh, I, in one of the exam tasks, uh, the students were asked in, to, to dimension this damper to obtain uh, 70% of the critical damping. So this is pretty much the model and I will now use it to benchmark the calculations in the exam. Just one comment. You can notice that this damper is connected to this bar end here and to a point in space here. And if you click on this triad you can notice that it's attached to rigid ground. And if you want to make a damper like that you can do the following. Select damper, you can choose one from point, accept it, and then you can choose the same point again. Choose global, that's important, and then you can add the set value with 0 0.3, like this. And then you see this will be the two point. Done. However, now you see this one is green, it's attached to this part called Hevain, and that's not what I want, so I have to de select it or detach it and then I have to bring up my reference plane like this and then I have to use the attach command select the triad and attach it to rigid ground then it turns blue and that's important let's get rid of this one again but that's the way you do it then we are ready to benchmark Twirgesh calculations. He's the professor in machine learning at NTNU. And here you see when you apply the vertical load of 1000 Newton 
uh, you get a maximum share stress of 114 megapascal. Uh, we will benchmark this value with the output from the strain gauge on the feather model. Then uh, we will identify the load that give this von Mises stresses. And 582 megapascal is the number you get when you divide the yield strength with the safety factor of 1.1. And um, that should give you a maximum load, vertical load of 2,940 newtons. We will apply a load gradually as a limited ramp in FEDEM and then we will identify, identify when the strain gauge or the stress contours will give us uh, stress level that exceeds uh, this value. Then finally we will apply this maximum force and see uh, the maximum displacement on the wheel hub and uh, according to the calculations that should be 76 millimeters. So the first task is to do the static test with a load of 1000 newton and we will apply it as a limited ramp function and then we can check the maximum uh, shear stress uh, either by checking the output from the strain gauge or do a full FEM analysis of the torsion bar. And then we can animate the stresses. And we can also use these results to estimate the vertical stiffness because we will need it later when we estimate the critical damping value of the damper. First, we will check the maximum shear when this load is 1000 newtons. And here you see that this load is uh, represented by this function, limited ramp. And let's have a look at it. Here you see uh, this function will increase um, the force from zero uh, with a slope of 1000 uh, acting in one second. That means the function will get uh, give us a force ap application like this starts at zero, increases linearly until 1000 newtons, and then it's kept constant. This might be uh, cause some transients because it's not really smooth and it could have been applied in more than one second to make sure that no dynamic effects are, are acting. But um, uh, we will output the results after one second and I don't think we will see any oscillations. Um, so this is the load and we can all simulate the results. We start the simulation, run. And I think uh, this one will finish quite s fast. We have to load it again, I think, like this. Perhaps we can speed it up a bit. You can scale this any way you want. And here you see the deformation in the structure. Well, this is actually just the rigid body part of the deformation in FEDEM. Uh, anyway, now we can output the strain time histories here. After we have um, recovered the strain rosettes. First, we have to make sure that we calculate the strain and stress time histories for the same time window. We start at zero and stop at one second when the as when the load is fully applied. Okay, and then we can run the recover, not the mold shapes. We want to recover the strain rosettes. Let's have a look at uh, this window. Yeah, it's finished already. Then we can have a look at the curve, strain rosette outputs here. Let's have a look at it. And here you see, um, I first I've added one function which is a constant function. It's an internal function, and um, uh, that's fun that function has a value which is uh, simply 140 megapascals, which is the shear stress that was calculated in uh, analytically in the exam. And here you see the output from the strain rosette. Here you can select various type of results from the rosette, but here I select max shear, and here we share see after one second we have always the same values but there is a small deviation and um, the FEDEM outputs uh, gives me a value of 110 11 uh, megapascals while the analytical calculations gave 140 megapascals uh, the reason i believe is that 
we have a lo quite large deformation here. That means that um, since this is conservative, the arm from the center axis here to the application point is actually shorter in the, the FEDIM simulation. It gets nonlinear, while this is based on a linear model. So this is how you can uh, verify the maximum shear stress based on the, the strain gauge, gauge outputs. But there is also another way to do it. Uh, we can calculate a full FEM analysis. We can um, use strain recovery setup. We use the same time range. We used start time zero, stop time one second, then all load is applied. And the increment could be larger, but let's use 0 0.1. Okay. And then we want to do the stress analysis for this assembly. Um, we don't need to run stress analysis for both. We can just include the part that we are interested in, and this that's it, this one. So let's go to Objects, Parts, Torsionstav, and then we right-click here, and we click Solve Stresses. Then let's bring up the list we know to see when the simulation is finished. There it is. Then we can go to the results and we can click on the max share and deformations. Um, we can load deformations, but we don't want the maximum share. We want the von Mises stresses. No, we don't. We want the max share. Load animation. And then we have to select the right, uh, right time step. And here you see the stresses will change. Let's se select the last one. There we have it. It's blue. It's hard to tell exactly the right value. But then we can go to the this tab here. And we can specify 140, 14, E6, which is megapascal. And then you see that. This is the value that we have in this torsion beam. We could, of course, increase it a bit to see exactly the value. Yeah, it's below 120 megapascal. So that's two ways to identify the maximum shear stress on this model. You can use, it, use strain gauges or you can run a full FEM analysis of the part that you were interested in. The next test is to find out which force level uh, that gives a von Mises stress of 582 megapascal in the torsion bar. And this is the value that we calculated based on the yield strength and the safety factor. So what we will do is to apply a limited ramp function uh, with a peak load of 2,914 newtons, which are the force level that was calculated analytically as the force that gave this stress. So what we'll do is to create a curve uh, in FEDEM that shows the load, um, applied load, vertical load, versus strain rosette for Mises stress. And then we will identify the stress level uh, that uh, gives us the maximum force. Let's check the maximum load. I select this load. And then I want to choose another function, not the 1000 limited RAM function, but another RAM function, which looks like this, increases the load to 3000 newtons within one second. And the 3000 is above the load level that gave uh, the yield stress of based on uh, the analytical calculations. So now I've selected this one, and then I can run the simulation. First, I run the dynamic simulation. And then I can see that it actually deforms quite much more. And since the load is conservative, I guess that means the arm will become uh, shorter. And that might give me wrong results. But let's check. I'll uh, then expand or um, calculate their strain rosettes. And then when that one is finished as well, uh, then I can show the curve. And this curve is defined like this. I have a, in the y-axis, I've selected the stress tensor uh, for Mises. And then 
as the x-axis. I'm not selecting time, but I've selected force value, the applied force value. And let's uh, check the results. Have to zoom a bit. And um, here we see that we have a specified uh, load level, I think 2940, according to analytical calculations, gave 582 megapascal. And here I have only 556. So that means uh, the stresses in the simulations are lower than in the analytical calculations. But let's check one thing first before we conclude anything. No, I made two changes to my model. Uh, in the first simulation, I did use a conservative load that was referenced, or the directions were referenced to the global coordinate system. But now I've selected two points on my arm, these two points, and um, they are uh, attached to the part called Hevarm. And that means that these two points will follow this uh, part when it's deformed. And that gives me a non-conservative uh, follower load. That could make a change. And then in the first simulation, I used a damper with a coefficient of 606 Newton per meter per second, which was um, the damper that was proposed in the exam. But then it wasn't used for the static analysis, so that one could very well give a difference. So now I switched off the damper, and then I can run the simulation. And when it's completed, I can run the strain rosette to recovery. And then I guess it's finished. There it is finished, yes. Then I can load my curve. And let's see what we have here. Now we can zoom this part of the curve. And then 582, it's here, 502 megapascal. So let's zoom here. This is 582. There it is. Then we have, yeah, we have a force, predicted force at 2,969 newtons, which is quite close to the analytical calculations. It was 2,940. 2940. Uh, that deviation is probably due to the fact that I'm running a dynamic simulation versus a static calculation. And here we have structural damping on both parts. And yeah, that's the reason, I guess. But we are pretty close. Uh, another way to identify this maximum load is to do the same as we did previous example. We can run a full FEM analysis of this torsional beam. We press solve, stresses. Um, then we do a, a reverse model reduction. We expand displacements from the external nodes to the internal, or actually every node. And now we are finished. Then we can load an animation, which is loading full MISI stresses and doing the averaging. And um, also it includes the flexibility of this part. So let's have a look. Now we can go to the last frame. And here we see that red is 582 megapascal. Let's step one back. And you see here now we have a lower stress. So it is shows that we are pretty close here. In the exam, uh, the students also had to predict the dynamic uh, amplification factor. And that means the, the displacement amplitude for the static case uh, versus the dynamic case. Uh, I'm not applying the same uh, dynamic excitation. Uh, I will use a pulse load of 2740 Newton, which was the static load. Um, in uh, my previous simulation, I got um, a displacement which was 74 millimeters. And in the uh, analytical calculations, it, it was 76 millimeters. So let's check how big the displacement will be 
when I apply a pulse load, a square pulse load, which actually contains all frequencies. So square pulse. First I will run without no damper and then I will tune the damper based on some analytical calculations and then I can show you how you do it in automatically in FEDEM by using the control system. And I'm using the same mass and the EXM of 9 kilos. So let's check the transient dynamics versus the static results. Then we change the load again, click on the load and now I select the transient excitation here and let's have a look at it. It has the same amplitude, 2940 newtons. We can have a look at it and you see here it's a square pulse function which if you do a Fourier it will actually include all harmonic frequencies. So that's why I also included uh, component modes for the components here because that excitation is really high frequent. So then we have the load here, transient excitation, and then we can run the simulation and then simultaneously output the curves here. So here we see the dynamic performance. And now remember there is no damping here. The only damping we have is the structural relay damping. And let's see what we have here, what kind of peak uh, displacement. Um, here we have roughly 140 uh, millimeters and it was initially 74. That means we have a dynamic amplification factor of, of almost 2 in this example. And then I'll show you how to tune the damper so that you can actually uh, get a critical damper that uh, reduces this dynamic amplification. Here I made a spreadsheet that uh, calculate the critical damping property for me. First I've used uh, the force that I applied, that was 2740 newtons. It gave me a vertical displacement that was uh, 74 millimeters. Uh, then I can predict the vertical stiffness. It's uh, simply the force divided by the displacement. It's roughly 37,000 newton per meter. And remember this vertical stiffness is introduced by the torsional stiffness of the bar, nothing else. Then I had a mass, a hub mass of 9 kilos. I neglect uh, the structural mass of the bars um, because to, I want to simplify it. And then if I calculate the eigenfrequency, which is simply the stiffness divided by the mass and the square root of that number, gives me the eigenfrequency in radians per second. And then this gives me the value not in radians per second but in hertz. That's roughly 10 hertz. And then I can calculate the critical damping, which is two times the square root of the stiffness multiplied by, by the mass. So this is the damping ratio I should use in FEDEM in order to give me a critical damping. So let's check if that's true. Remember, this is the dynamic behavior before we added the damper. Uh, this is without any damping at all, except for structural damping, relay damping, uh, which damps these vibrations. And you see the amplification factor is roughly 2 here. So let's delete the results and add the damping um, property, 1155. That gives us the critical damping. And let's run the simulation once more. Here you see the response to the square pulse function. And um, let's first check the peak. It's, um, it's here. Now we have a maximum displacement uh, in the dynamic simulation, which is 75 millimeters. Uh, the static displacement was 74. That means we have a dynamic amplification factor of close to 1. And without the damper, we had a dynamic amplification factor of 2. So remember that when you're running your old car, you should change the damper if it's not working properly. So let's wrap up the results. Here's a summary of the results. Uh, these are the analytical results. And they are probably uh, correct because in this example, uh, the flexibility was represented by the torsional beam or shaft. 
and that means we can use analytical formulas to calculate uh, these results. And also the bar uh, that the hub was mounted to was almost infinite stiff, so we didn't have to include that in the calculations. And then we could use very simple analytical formulas. We see that uh, with a uh, load, vertical load of 1000 newtons, we have a shear stress of 140 megapascals. FEDM gave 113 when we used a quasi static simulation instead and eliminated the dynamic effects. Uh, here we identified the maximum load analytically, it was 2940 newton. Then the Fulmisi stress was 582 newtons. FEDM predicted a uh, load that was a bit higher, probably also due to the dynamic effects. Um, if you had been running a quasi-static analysis, I probably would have got the same results. Then um, we calculated the maximum displacement with an applied load of 2,940 newtons. Uh, analytically, it was predicted to be 76 millimeters and FEDM predicted 74 millimeters. Very close. In addition here, you can see results from from a diff uh, another video I made. I uh, benchmarked these uh, results in the two annex solvers. First, the modal solver, and you see the results here are quite accurate, except for the load. Uh, and the displacement are, is also quite correct. But remember, in uh, a modal solver, I used only one torsional mode in the shaft to represent the flexibility and then I applied uh, the, the loads statically and dynamically. Uh, quite correct. Uh, then when I used the direct solver, the SOL109, I got pretty much the same results. Um, the predicted uh, force was closer than, than on the, with the modal solver. So that's a summary of the different solutions I heard the analytical calculations, then a modal solver that calculates the modal amplitude and the results based on that. Uh, the error here is that we introduce or truncate modes. I also only used one mode to represent the flexibility here. Here's a direct solver, which solves all nodal degrees of freedom for each time step. FEDEM is something in between. It calculates the displacements in the triads or the external nodes for each time step. Then it calculates the internal degrees of freedom or displacements after the dynamic simulation. So four different approaches. They gave pretty, pretty much the same results. Uh, at the end of this course, I will do a physical test of this uh, trailer suspension system, and then we can compare the physical measurements with these results. Thanks for watching.